So in this video, I'm going to talk about two additional mechanisms that TCP Tahoe introduced to control congestion. Better RTT around trip time estimation and self-clocking. To recall that TCP Tahoe introduced three basic mechanisms that allowed it to tame congestion and essentially allow the internet to work again. The prior video talked about a congestion window and this idea of the slow start and congestion avoidance states. Now let's talk about the second mechanism, timeout estimation. So it turns out that estimating your round trip time is really critical for retransmissions and for timeouts. If your round trip time is estimated to be too short, that is, you estimate to be shorter than what it is, then this means that you're going to waste capacity. You are going to think that the packet wasn't successfully received when it has been and retransmit unnecessarily. This is then going to trigger slow start. So this is really bad in the sense if I have a nice window size, I'm sending data, but my RTT estimates are too short, I'm now entering slow start unnecessarily. Now, if the RTT estimation is too long, that's also a problem because it could be that Really, I could have retransmitted a long time ago. The packet didn't get there. But say, let's say I estimated an RTT of five minutes when it's only a couple hundred milliseconds. Your protocol is going to sit there dead for five minutes before it issues a timeout and tries to do a retransmission. So this is fine. But the real challenge is that, especially on the internet, as we've seen with packet switching, RTT can be highly dynamic. Furthermore, it can vary significantly with load. Even as you are starting to send things faster, you can change your own RTT, even if the rest of the world remains the same. And so how do you estimate RTT very inexpensively, very quickly, given these constraints? So before TCP Tahoe, um, there was a very simple mechanism, which is that R is your RTT estimate, and you'll just initialize it to something reasonable, like, okay, we'll guess uh, 500 milliseconds or something. Um, then you are generating a measurement from the most recently ACT data packet. So you say, okay, I sent packet 5 at this time. I now got the ACK at you know, time plus 57 milliseconds or say 200 milliseconds. I'm then going to estimate M will be you know, 57 or 200 milliseconds. I then maintain an exponentially weighted moving average. So alpha R plus 1 minus alpha M. So this is basically saying take my existing estimate and incorporate some fraction of my new estimate. So if say, let's just say R is equal to 100 milliseconds and my measurement is equal to uh, 80 milliseconds and alpha, which are the weighting of history to the present sample, let's just say alpha is equal to uh, 0.9. So I'm going to weight history a lot. This is a way to sort of smooth out noise. Then the new R is going to be 0.9 times 100 milliseconds plus 0.1 times 80 milliseconds equal to 98 milliseconds. And so this one sample at 80 milliseconds is going to sort of go one-tenth of the way between R and M. So you can imagine a lower alpha value means that you're going to weight the current measurements more versus a higher alpha value weight history more. Then your timeout is based on this factor beta R and beta was 2. And so if you see that the you don't get an acknowledgement for twice your average, then you assume there's a timeout. And then you trigger a timeout. So this seems like a totally reasonable algorithm, you know, at first blush. So what's the problem? It turns out that the problem is that the fact that uh, R is a certain value should not say anything about what the distribution of RTT values is like. So one way to imagine is, let's say, you know, here's a graph and I'm looking at a distribution of the round trip times of packets. They're not constant, they're varying over time. Well, in some cases, I might have, here's my, my average, let's call it A. I might have a distribution like this, right? Where, in fact, if I were to look at 2A, that less than 0.00001% uh, of packets take that long, at which point beta, a beta of 2, is a tremendously conservative estimate. But it could also be I have a slightly different case, where here, let's just say a, I have a, another link or another path, which is B where my distribution uh, looks more like this. Where if I look at 2B, some say 20% of, pa of uh, packets tend to have an RTT of that long. Depending on the dynamics of the network, you can have very different distributions of RTTs. And this approach didn't keep that in mind. And so for uh, TCP connections that had very, very tight distributions, beta is way too conservative, um, and you end up being idle when you don't need to be. It estimates too large an RTT. 
But when the R, when the RTT has a very broad distribution, a beta equals to two equals two is uh, far too uh, aggressive, and you end up retransmitting unnecessarily. So TCP Tahoe uh, solved this problem by essentially including the notion of the variance of the RTT in its estimates. Um, and so this is the algorithm that, that was proposed and which is used. Um, and essentially what you're going to do is, just like before, you're doing an exponentially weighted moving average. Um, you have this, R, this R, uh, RTT estimate. Um, and what you're doing is also measuring your error in the estimate. And so given I have this estimate R, and I have a measurement m, I measure the error to be m minus r. And I multiply it by this gain factor, and because these terms, I'm essentially multiplying by minus r. So there's the alpha factor um, that we saw in the prior approach. And then we measure the variance. And so the variance is, again, with weighted average, is the gain factor of the error minus the variance. Um, but the So the basic idea here is we're measuring not only an exponentially weighted moving average of r, uh, but we are also measuring um, an exponentially weighted moving average of the variance over time. And then our timeout is equal to the average plus four times the variance, where beta is four. So this way, if we have, as before, if we have a very tight distribution, then with a variance uh, like this, then we're going to time out when the packet, when the variance is just, when you have a, a packet that's just four times the variance out. Similarly, if you have a very broad distribution, and your variance is going to be way out here, then you'll end up timing out when the very when the when it's four times that value, and so it's very uh, it's very likely that the packet was actually lost. In the case of tremendous congestion, you're not getting uh, estimates, you know, nothing is happening. You exponentially increase uh, this timeout. So here are two graphs from Van Jacob's paper which show the performance of this RTT estimation. And so what the faint line on the bottom shows is the actual measured RTTs of packets from uh, acknowledgments. And the solid line above shows the timeout estimate uh, for the TCP algorithm. And so the idea is that in a perfect world that the timeout would, pr would perfectly mirror this such that, gosh, we didn't get it, and if we just wait a little longer, then we know to retransmit. So there are two points. This figure on the left, you can see that there's this huge gap. So TCP is sitting idle for a long time when really it could have retransmitted much sooner. There's also cases where it crosses. So this is kind of bad, where this means that the packet took longer, you know, the estimate was in fact uh, too, uh, was too short. And so if you look, this is the pre-Tahoe algorithm, on the right is the post-Tahoe, is the Tahoe algorithm, you see that it's tracking uh, the RTT is much, much better, right? That the gap here between the observed RTTs and the timeouts is much closer. So the third improvement that TCP Tahoe brought was something called self-clocking. And this, in some ways, the greatest conceptual uh, contribution of TCP Tahoe. This idea that you want to essentially clock out the packets that you send based on the acknowledgments you receive. And so... This is the, and this is the, sort of the, uh, the conceptual model that Van Jacobson laid out. So let's say I have a sender that has a really big pipe. We show by sort of being fat here where the, the, the volume of these packets is constant. And the receiver also is a fat pipe. But there is this bottleneck link in the middle. Well, since there's this bottleneck link, what's going to happen is these packets that are sent very fast from the sender are going to be stretched out in time. They're going to take longer. And they're then going to be spaced out in time at the receiver. The receiver, if it generates acknowledgments directly in response to these packets, then it's going to be sending acknowledgments back with the same timing that it's receiving them, which is determined by this congest by this um, the, con the bottleneck congestion link. Then those acts are going to arrive. Uh, they traverse the bottleneck link. You can see they're much shorter, so they're not filling it. Right? They only take a part of it. And then these acknowledgments arrive at the sender corresponding to the frequency of the packets arriving at the receiver. And then if the sender sends new packets timed by these acknowledgments, which essentially is going to inherently rate limit itself or space out packets in time so that they're entering this bottleneck link at the right rate. That is just as a packet's leaving, like here, which then falls through with an ACK, a new packet starts arriving. 
And it's this idea of self-clocking that you don't put a new packet in the network until one comes out and you clock yourself based on this is what allows TCP in a very simple mechanism to not stuff lots of packets into the network and to not suddenly send huge bursts of packets that saturate this link. Because you can imagine there is some queue here. And so even if TCP knows, oh, I can only send five packets per round trip time, if it sends a burst of five packets, then those packets might fall off the end of this queue. But if it's are spaced out properly due to this timing, then it's going to be feeding them out at a nice steady rate, which will fill this uh, pipe without overfilling the queue. And so the principle here is you only want to put data into the network when data is left. Otherwise, you're increasing the amount of data in the network and you're causing congestion. And so you send new data directly in response to acknowledgments. But also, it's important that you send acknowledgments aggressively, such as we saw with duplicate acknowledgments. They're a really important signal to the, to the sender. And so if you are receiving additional segments and you, the segments that you have missing segment, you should send acknowledgments for those segments aggressively so it sees that there are duplicate acknowledgments, that it gets a signal that something has been missed. It also knows on receiving those acknowledgments, those duplicate acknowledgments, that packets have left the network and it can make decisions accordingly. So this is the, those three mechanisms of a congestion window, uh, better RTT estimation that considers variance, and self-clocking are really the foundation of TCP Tahoe. And so in 1970, 1987, 1988, Van Jacobsen fixed TCP with these mechanisms, few, as well as a few other tricks, and published this seminal TCP paper on TCP Tahoe. Um, and this is basically solved TCP's uh, congestion control problem. The internet started working again. Um, and this actually spawned a huge area of research in TCP and this whole idea of how do you manage your sending rate to not uh, congest the network. And so in this next, I've just talked about the first version, TCP Tahoe, but there's a long history. So in the next video is going to talk about uh, TCP Reno, New Reno, which are closer to what's done today. Um, they add a couple new mechanisms. And so if this is interesting, I, I totally recommend reading uh, Van Jacobson's original paper, Congestion, Avoidance, and Control. It sort of lays out a little bit of the story of what they saw and then these mechanisms and how they solved, and how they solved it.